Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a continuation of the last episode that we had on terms of contracts. Uh, as you remember, we started uh, the distinction between uh, terms and representation. And this was being done within the context of uh, pre-negotiation statements. In other words, a pre-contractual uh, statement or, uh, or negotiation statement. In other words, when uh, parties are talking, having conversation as a, a prelude to the conclusion of a contract. A lot of things are said. Now, uh, not all the things which are said are meant to form part of the contract, which will eventually be made. So therefore, it is important for us to determine which of the statements made at the pre-contractual negotiation stage would eventually form part of the contract which will be made. So that is the basis for the discussion that uh, we saw to do uh, the last time. And we noted that uh, it is uh, useful uh, or pertinent for us to know uh, whether a statement made is a representation in which case it will not form part of the contract or it's a term in which case to form part of the contract. And we explain the, the, the justification for such distinction as being that where a statement made during the, 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 the pre-contractual negotiation stage, for example, is classified as a, a representation. What that means is that should it turn out to be untrue or should it turn out to be false, uh, the other party to whom it was made, if you like the representer, uh, will have a course of action for misrepresentation or a thought of deceit uh, as it were. And uh, on the other hand, if the, that statement is classified or labeled as a term, then what that means is that is an integral part of the contract, which is eventually made. And for that matter, in the event of it uh, being untrue or in, in the event of it uh, being not as it was meant to be, that is a, a breach of contract. And the remedies which are available for breach of contract will definitely uh, kick in. So that is the rationale for trying to uh, 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 classify or categorize statements which are made uh, before a contract is made as to whether it is a representation or a term. And we said that there are four ways of trying to do the distinction. Uh, in other words, uh, some rules of thumb guide the court as uh, the court will look at the importance of the statement. That is one. The other one is that the court will look at the time between the making of the statement and the making of the contract. The third one is that the court will find out uh, whether after the statement has been made by word of mouth, uh, it was eventually reduced into writing. And, and finally, we also talk about the fairness. The court will look at the, 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 the relative uh, expertise or experience of the maker of the statement and also the recipient of the statement to guide the court in making a determination as whether such a statement should be treated as a term or a representation. Now we proceeded uh, in our last episode by uh, taking them one after the other. And I think that uh, we dwelt much on importance of the statement. <laughs> For that, we basically made the point that where the particular statement which was made at the pre-contractual negotiation state is adjudged by the court to be something really important, then what that means is that it will be treated as having been meant to form part of the contract. For that matter, it is a term of contract and not a representation. So we cited the example of Angela the vegetarian uh, buying a pizza and inquire if uh, there was no uh, meat in it. And then the restaurant saying that there was no meat in it. And we said that, well, uh, the statement by the restaurant that there was no meat in the pizza is a, a statement which will be treated as of importance, major importance in the sense that the buyer is a, a, a vegetarian and for that matter, uh, such a statement is important. And if it turns out not to be so, uh, that will be a breach of contract and all that. So we discussed that. And again, uh, 
we were to continue by citing the case of Bannerman and White. And I think that was where the episode uh, ended. So in Bannerman and White, which is a, a case law illustration of the fact that the court will pay attention to the importance of the statement in making a determination as to whether it is a term or it is a representation. Uh, what happened in Bannerman and White? Well, uh, for our instant purpose, uh, it suffices to note that in Bannerman and White, uh, the buyer stated, if sulfur has been used, I do not want to know the price. I do not want to know the price. So this was the statement uh, by, the, by the purchaser. And uh, the court said that, yes, having regard to the, the context, the circumstances, uh, that statement will be treated as a term because it certainly appeared to be of uh, importance to the, the, the buyer. So that is how the court uh, goes about trying to do the distinction as to whether uh, it is a term or a representation. And similar thing happened in the case of a, a coachman against uh, uh, Hill. Yes, uh, in coachman against uh, 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 Hill too, uh, decided in 1947, uh, what happened was that the plaintiff uh, but the plaintiffs, uh, uh, but the defendants, uh, at the at the notion that is, uh, and uh, the the buyer, that is the plaintiff, inquired if the cow uh, was in calf, and, and making the point that if she was, he would not bid. And the auctioneer's uh, reply uh, was that she was not in calf, and that was held to be a term overriding the printed condition, which stated that no warranty uh, was given. Yeah, so uh, the essential point is that the court would judge the importance of the statement and the importance of the statement, the, the, the more important the statement appeared to be having regard to the circumstances, then the more likely the court to say that the statement is a term and not a representation and the vice versa. Uh, another point or another guideline which guides the court or which assists the court in classifying the pre-contractual statement as a term or a representation is timing. <laughs> we simply uh, mean that uh, where a statement was made and it took a longer time before the contract was made, uh, in that respect, the court will uh, conclude that that statement uh, was not meant to form part of the contract which was made. On the other hand, if it did not take a long time uh, after making of the statement for the contract to be concluded, then the court will, conclude, will say that the statement was meant to form part of the terms of the contract. So simply put, the more remote the statement is in terms of the timing uh, to the, the contract, uh, the court will say that it was not meant to be a term and just probably the representation. And then the nearer the statement to the timing of the contract, uh, the more likely the court will say that it was meant to form part of the terms of the, of the contract. Yeah, so that is how the court uh, goes about uh, making the distinction. And that is why, if you look at the uh, interesting case of a Ridledge and Mackay, the defendant has stated uh, that a motorcycle, which was the subject matter of uh, a proposal, was 1942 model. Now, in the written contract, uh, which was signed a week later, there was no mention whatsoever of the date of the model. So if you look at the facts, there was a lapse of, let's say, a week between the two events. That is the making of the statement uh, that the, 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 the cycle was made in a particular year and the eventual uh, 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 contract of sale. And the lapse of a week between the two events uh, influenced or weighed the court uh, heavily 
as a, a factor which militated against construing the statement as a contractual term. So therefore, if the statement had been made, uh, probably, you know, after the statement had been made, no time, the contract was made and so on and so forth, uh, that could have probably uh, be something uh, else. Yeah. Then another uh, factor which the court also uh, pays attention to uh, is that the court will find out whether the after making of the oral statement, that is the, the parole or the viva voce uh, was there a subsequent written contract. In other words, uh, where a statement has been made verbally, that is by word of uh, <laughs> and uh, subsequently, there's a, a contract in writing, but that contract in writing does not include the spoken statement. <laughs> the court will say that the spoken statement uh, was a mere representation and not a term because the, 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 the spoken statement on the oral statement was made earlier in time before the written contract and it did not find its way into the written contract. So the assumption will be that the parties did not intend that to form part of the contract. So that is how <laughs> thought uh, goes about it. And maybe you can cite the case of Ridledge and McKay again as illustration uh, about the sale of the <laughs> And you will notice that in that case, during the verbal negotiation, the owner made the point that the motorbike or cycle was an NT42 model. But the truth of the matter was that it was 1930 model. Now, later on, uh, when the written contract was made, it did not include any statement about the year of make or manufacture. And for that matter, the statement regarding the year of make was a representation, not a term of contract. Because you see that the statement regarding the year of make was made, uh, if you like, at the oral level. And later on, there was a, a written contract. But the written contract was absolutely silent on that. And that is why the conclusion was that it was not meant to be a term, but just a representation. Well, another important point which uh, we need to also pay attention to is the special knowledge of the statement maker. Uh, the courts will also be guided whether uh, a statement is a representation or a term by having a uh, records to the, if any special knowledge or skill was possessed by the statement maker or the representor uh, as uh, it were. And I have, I referred you to two cases, uh, the Bentley Productions against Harold Smith uh, Motors in the Shesha and Fifoot. I've indicated the pages there, as well as the uh, uh, Oscar uh, Shares Limited against uh, 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 Williams. Very interesting, but the contrasting uh, uh, cases. Uh, maybe uh, because some of you might have uh, forgotten the case and uh, you do not know whether you can locate your case law, but you have to. Uh, let me say a few words about the uh, Dick Bentley uh, Production Limited against Harold Smith. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff asked the defendants uh, who were uh, car uh, dealers to find him a well-vetted Bentley car. A well-vetted Bentley car. That was the emphasis. A car was found. The defendants informed the plaintiff that they were in a position to find out the history of cars. And this car had been fitted with a replacement engine and gear boss and had since traveled only 20,000 miles. 
the defendants rely on the odometer reading and had not checked the details. And the plaintiff bought the car and discovered uh, later that uh, this representation as to mileage was false or untrue. And whereupon the plaintiff sued the defendant seeking damages for breach of contract. And the court uh, held that the statement amounted to a warranty and therefore the plaintiff was entitled to damages. The statement was treated as a term, not a representation uh, because uh, the court paid uh, importance to the special knowledge or skill of the maker of the statement. Yeah, so just look at the, the maker of the statement, they were car dealers. So the court to the view that, yes, uh, they have the requisite uh, background uh, to be able to uh, know. And it's very interesting to look at the Lord Denning's uh, uh, short opinion, which I would like you to look at. And Lord Denning will try and draw a distinction between a uh, Dick Bentley production from the case of uh, Oscar uh, shares uh, limited. And maybe just I'll quote a, a portion of uh, Lord Denning's uh, statement. Quote, the first point is whether this representation, namely that it had done 20,000 miles only since they have been fitted with a replacement engine and year bus, was an innocent misrepresentation, which does not give rise to damages or whether it was a warranty, which uh, it, whether it was a warranty. And Lord Denning uh, continued. It was said by Holt CJ that an affirmation at the time of sale is a warranty, provided it appear on evidence to be so intended. But that word intended has given rise to difficulties. I endeavor to explain in Oscar Shares Limited against Williams that the question whether a warranty was intended depends on the conduct of the parties on their on their ways and behavior rather than on their thoughts. If an intelligent bystander would reasonably infer that a warranty was intended, that will suffice. What conduct then, what ways and behavior lead to the inference of a warranty? Or then he continued, looking at the cases once more, as we have done so often, it seems to me that if a representation is made in the course of dealings for a contract for the very purpose of inducing the other party to act upon it and actually inducing him to act upon it by entering into the contract. That is prima facie ground for inferring that it was intended as a warranty. It is not necessary to speak of it uh, being collateral. Suffice it that it was intended to be acted upon, was in fact acted upon. And, and so on. I mean, Lord Den was just trying to make the point that uh, what is really important in trying to uh, make the determination is the, the conduct of the parties and their intention. Their intention is not what is in their mind, but what can be gathered from uh, how they behave uh, towards uh, each other. Yeah, so that is what will enable us to know as whether the statement made was meant to form part of the contract and very much so where the maker, for example, claims to have a special knowledge or appears to have a special knowledge, then a statement by him will not be treated as just ordinary representation. It's more likely to be treated as a term of a contract. But I must say that these four tests in making the determination as to whether a pre-contractual statement is uh, a term or representation, they do not act in, if you like, all or nothing fashion. They, a number of them can uh, operate uh, together in the same case, yeah. So it's, they are not mutually exclusive. They can uh, work hand in hand, uh, you know, in a number of instances. Yeah. So in a nutshell, uh, this is how uh, the court uh, proceed in trying to classify or categorize statements made before a contract as whether it's a representation or it is a term of contract. So just to recap, we've said that the court will pay attention to the importance of the statement and two, the court will pay attention to uh, uh, the timing of the statement and three, the court will pay attention to 
uh, the, the, the making of oral statement and the subsequent uh, uh, adoption of a written contract, if the oral statement did not find its way into the written contract, then that may influence the court to say that it wasn't meant to be part of the contract. And uh, finally, that's the fourth one, the court to find out whether the maker of the statement had any special knowledge or skill. If he or she did, then the court would treat that as a term and not representation. Yeah, so this uh, uh, is, is, a, is a very short uh, recording that I'm doing. And because I don't want you to be so tight, I will just stop it and there'll be another short recording too on implied terms. So thank you very much.